Tomorrow, Saturday, April 16th, The Man of God, the latest film by Bolanle Austin Peters, will premiere on the global streaming giant Netflix. It is indeed the first Netflix original movie by the hardworking and dynamic lady of the stage. The intensely entertaining musical movie, The Man of God, tells the moving story of Samuel, played by Akanani, a son of a pastor who runs away from home to pursue his worldly cravings. He starts off as an undergraduate Afrobeat musician with a fast life involving ladies and booze in tow. Hard times and romantic overtures lead him to singing in a church, but eventually branches out to float his own church, all in a bid to make quick returns and live large. Torn among several women and hounded by the law, Samuel eventually suffers the fate that awaits those who call on the name of God in vain. His redemption lies in retracing his steps back to his humble, God-fearing beginnings. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> give me. So I've met a couple of you today. Thank you once again for having me here. The Amazing Grace Fellowship seems like it's something else. So let's hear it. Yeah, the work that God is using you to do in this ministry, mm -hmm. we cannot open <coughs> Ah, and well, of course, Brother Sam. Uh, nice to meet you, brother. Hey, I you know, like I was God. saying, what she's doing, especially in the female hostel. Uh, yes, that's what I was going to say. Um, is it okay if uh, she shows me around? Right? Oh, yeah, but of course. Uh, Pastor Joy, please show Pastor Zach around while I make final preparations. I hope you don't mind. Joining us now is Bonale Austin Peters, producer and director of the movie, The Man of God. Good morning and thank you for joining us, BAP. It's my pleasure to be here. Well, uh, let me add to it to say uh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed the premiere. When I saw uh, that the uh, attire for the uh, occasion should be heavenly glamorous, <laughs> I looked at my wardrobe, there's nothing that is heavenly glamorous. <laughs> it's the easiest look. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's Honestly, why you stood me up, right? Because no, 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 no. I was there. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Anyway, congratulations. Thank you. you know, this is going on Netflix tomorrow. But could you take us through the storyline, you know, and what particular message uh, you plan to put across? Is it about discipline? Is it about self-discovery? Is it about liberation? Is it about, about the melodrama of the kind of choices that uh, human beings make, particularly yeah. young people? Yeah. So thank you. I mean, first is that I use my art as a form of social commentary. I'm a student of literature and history, so I believe that the arts is a powerful tool for us in our society to use to depict all the things that are going wrong and a possible escape for some of us who are traumatized by the things that we see in Nigeria, and also um, a redemptive tool as well for society building. So this story came to me as those who saw Bling Legoshi and similar scenario. I've been studying our society, especially this malaise of um, religiosity. You know, I'm a woman of faith, but what I find in Nigeria is that increasingly, a lot of people are being um, driven into this crazy lust for worshiping men rather than God. And a lot of men are turning um, this spiritual institutions into commerce, and they're using it for personal gains. So I used um, the story of the prodigal son, um, which was spun very beautifully by a phenomenal writer, Shola Dada. And um, we tried to explore so many themes, the themes of, um, like you said, discipline, self-discovery, um, faith, um, wildlife, and ultimately redemption. Because at the end of the day, I always try to get a message across that what is it that we're doing wrong and what can we be doing better as a society? Well, that redemption theme is timely this weekend since we're celebrating indeed. Easter, uh, yeah, yeah. of course, yes. But what I found was the nuances within the characters. I mean, I hate one-dimensional characters. <laughs> and you did not have a single one. So tell us how that came about. How did you get the performances that you got out of your actors, which they all performed brilliantly? And mm -hmm. also the material, the depth, the richness of the material. I think that um, I'll attribute that to the fact that, you know, I do stage. Stage actually just it grooms you. I mean, I've directed God knows how many plays now, and um, what you tend to see with stages, you don't have second chances. So an actor has to be believable. 
and an actor must know what he or she is doing to deliver a stellar performance. There's a reason why some of our plays have now traveled the world. And um, I think we can hold our own next to any Western production right now, um, based on the quality of performances that are coming out of stage in Nigeria and terror culture. So in directing over the past 10 years, you understand how to make a connection with people. Because what is often lacking in a lot of productions is that ability to connect. So once the emotions are not there and people can't feel what you're saying, you've lost the audience. Second is that I, I like you, I hate mono, you know, directional characters. You have to have layers. Those facets, we're all very complex people. There's no one person that is simple. I can't say Dr. Abati is this. He has many layers to him, same as myself. So what I try to do in exploring characters is to ensure that there are multiple layers to that person so that in unpeeling that onion, you begin to see why this person is the way he is, the backstory that led him to becoming what he or she has become, and ultimately the results of that behavior or character type. Okay, uh, so at first I'd like to ask about how you even got the team, the cast and crew in the first place, the characters. Because this is unconventional in the sense that it's not the normal Nigerian thing that they just look for big faces, and paddy paddy, yeah. which I, I would say is one of the biggest problems in Nollywood today. You can almost speak all the big faces and all of that. And secondly, and se okay, okay, good. And secondly, one step further for me would be what will be, you know, what do you envisage will be the way the churches will receive this? Because there's this defense going on and this fight back. You know, that you dare not say anything about the church. You can't even, I mean, and, and they put in that very big phrase, touch not my anointing. And my prophet not my. <laughs> so what, what did you envisage would be the reaction from the church? Okay, uh, the first question. Um, first is that I, I believe in competence. Um, fame doesn't really faze me. And um, we've built a brand that is solid. So if I put a product out based on the quality of the work that I'm known for, it sells us, even though I'm not, I don't have millions of followers, but the brand is stronger than the individual sitting here. Um, second is that our products, in choosing, I look for the best person that can do the job. So some people, Atlanta as an example, the lady who played Joy, Joy. is a completely Joy new girl. face. Joy girl. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind, because I know that if Joy is able to deliver the goods, it will bring the eyeballs that I need. So when we did Bling, um, the exact same thing. Elvina Ibru was the lead, and everybody in Nollywood said, oh, no, this is going to fail. And Netflix came back and said, this is one of the most watched films, mm. Nigerian films they ever put up. You know, so um, we should desist from this habit of just trying to follow the pack. I don't. I do what I know is right. And in growing an industry, it's important that we put competence forward as opposed to fame and popularity. Both have a, we have room for both, but we must always balance it with competency coming first, and that's what I do. The second question... How, how did you ever say that the churches were going to take this? So the first thing is I, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman of faith myself, and unlike most people, I follow God. I don't follow the men of God. So if... Um, Society has boxed us to the point that we're not even able to critique and think clearly about our behavior. And everybody believes that another individual has access to God and you don't, then there's something wrong with us. So my job as a mature Nigerian is to let us understand that there is a problem in this society right now. Our youth, our eld older people, we're all acting in a very blinded manner where an individual will tell you, Give me all your money. Give me all your problems, and I can resolve it. Who are you? <laughs> we all have access to God. I'm a man of God. You are a man of God. All of us are men of God. So it is this thinking, because I have actually seen how insidious and how destructive this has become to young people. I know some young people who have become involved in almost like a cultist movement. You know? They're not able to think clearly anymore, and it's important that we begin yes, to call this cultural. out. Oh. Okay, well, Netflix. I know you've done a lot, you know, um, you've turned uh, terror culture into a major cultural center and all of that. Uh, but are you excited by this Netflix, uh, you know, opportunity? 
What's your next project after the stage of him again? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm excited because it's, it's good that we can now put our products on, on, on platforms. Like there were people calling me from the States yesterday. We're waiting. We're just waiting, right? So it's good that Nigerians are able to get their products on international distribution platforms. And there's a lot going on in this space. Amazon is coming. Disney is coming. There's so much more that is going to happen in this space. So, yes, I'm excited. Um, but for me, it's just the beginning. We need to get better to the point that Nigerian content is paid as well as they do our counterparts across the ocean. So for as long as we're still being paid peanuts, for me, that's not a celebration. It's the first step in the right direction. So we keep pushing and hoping that things will get better. Next nice project. Oh, I have loads. <laughs> <laughs> I've shot two films. I don't know if you saw Collision. Collision Course will come out again on Netflix sometime in June. Um, that is about the NSARS. And again, it was just me trying to explore the brutalization of the psyche of every Nigerian. All of us are brutalized, mm. the police and the average person. So it was me coming, bringing us together to understand that the system is the problem. It's not the policeman and it's not you or I. That's the story of NSARS. It's gotten about 14 nominations so far and a couple of awards. And then I've done Fumila Ransom Kuti, her oh, story. Yeah. Oh, yeah, when is that coming out? Yeah. Probably later in the year or next year. Because I saw the preview. One of our feminist family. icons yeah. here in Nigeria. Yeah. Well, family. let's talk about your story and how you started. I mean, you've, done, you've been a restaurateur. You are now this huge cultural avatar. And let's talk about that. And in terms of the kind of cultural clout Nigeria does command all over the world and the part that you have played in that, tell us your story. Um, I'm a simple woman who just happened to... <laughs> get into the space. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Um, I think that um, my personality type is just that I'm a bit of an OCD person. When I want to do something, I just have to get it right. So when I jumped into the space, I had to make it work. So, I mean, like you said, we've done literary arts, we've done culinary arts, we've done performance, stage film, you know. We keep pushing. We keep pushing because we know that a lot of jobs will come out of this space because we know that a lot of skill sets that the young people have today that is relevant for them to be employed, they don't have, so they have to go into this space. And it's important that they have institutions that can absorb them. So in doing this also, we started a foundation. Well, we have something called an academy that is supported by a foundation that is going to be training young Nigerians on acquiring skill sets in the theater and the film industry as well. So I, it's been a long journey. It's been 19 years, almost 19 years of terror culture. And we've evolved, we've evolved, we keep evolving, and we're in a good space. We really are. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to go back to the, to the talk about the crew. Mm -hmm. And I noticed something pervasively in the industry, that you cannot have a good movie production without having partly or wholly a foreign crew. What is wrong with our local cinematographers, sound guys, I always see that, you know, it's called the South African effect. <laughs> you know, they, they, even in doing commercials, we have yeah. to bring in the South Africans. Um, I think first is we, we always have to ask ourselves, what happened to our education? It's, it cuts across, you know. Every single industry, um, things went, you know, south. So um, some skill sets are lacking. But what is good is that in the past, I think, couple of years, a lot more Nigerians are now more focused on acquiring those skills. So if you say mostly, it's not true. In terms of crew, on my set as an example, there were, we only had one foreigner. And that was the director of photography. Um, he's a man who has won an Oscar and, um, for his film Tutsi in South Africa. And what he brings in terms of experience and in terms of skills is just... You just don't have anybody that can do that in certain settings. So that is one of the problems that we have. But with the gap that a lot of us are trying to fill now, and a lot of Nigerians are now, because of COVID, et cetera, learning and acquiring a lot of skills um, on the internet and also through practice. We now have some good, we have some good DOPs. All our sound guys are always Nigerians in Nigeria now. They're good sound guys, good lighting guys. Um, but there's still a small gap. It's like even every, every sector, you know, but well, we will get there. We will get there. Okay. Doing business in Nigeria, <laughs> because culture is also business in a, in a sense. What are the key challenges that you have had to face? It's 
said something about skills gap, skill set, and all of that. But there are other environmental issues. Yeah. What are those challenges that you face? I think the first thing is I keep saying it is infrastructure. Um, there's a, we all know there's a deficit in Nigeria. You know, things like electricity, it's a problem. We have to run our Gen 12 units, uh, it's an event space. So we have about four generators. The cost of diesel, running that business, it's just absolutely unbelievable the amounts that we get these days. So that is a major problem. Um, the other thing in terms of skills, like you said, when I started out, it was very difficult to find people who had the skills in tourism. You know, we're sort of like a touristic destination. It's very difficult to find people who know how to deal with tourists in Nigeria. It's a very underdeveloped area, sector. So maybe in Cross River State. Perhaps. Cross River is very good. Yeah, absolutely correct. But things have improved. This is 18 years down the line. So I'm talking about then. Now things are improving um, significantly. And I think, of course, the other thing that anyone would talk about is funding an arts institution. You know how they're funded internationally, yeah. by grants, by subventions, mm -hmm. all sorts. We have nothing. So I've had to make an arts institution become a business, which is a model that I don't think that anybody else outside of Nigeria has ever done. But through um, the approach that we had, which is multifaceted, we're able to use one to pay for the other and to pay for the other, and, and we've, we've made it work over the years. Similar to how the foundation supports the academy, but I'd like more information about that, because I'm sure a lot of viewers are wondering yeah. about that academy and the foundation. So what we've done is we've created a, an online platform called Terra Arts um, for the, Terra Academy for the Arts. Um, essentially, we're going to be teaching um, students on lighting, sound, um, hair, makeup for stage, script writing. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that a lot of students have access, not necessarily, and it's free. It's free, and it's, it's important that we ensure that we get access to people who ordinarily would not have access to this kind of education. So we just finished doing the same project with the American Consulate. We trained 1,000 people in, um, in River State on these skill sets. So we're going to expand it now and take it further into the public. How do people um, apply? It's going to be online. We'll, we'll announce when it's time and people will see all the details. That's very important work. Yeah. Great. Uh, so let's talk about the future of uh, stage in the country because Kudos to you, you're one of those people that really brought stage back, and back the musicals, Saro and the likes and all Thank of that. You. you know, but a lot of people still argue that the future of stage looks very bleak. It's not pervasive, it's just a small crowd that gets it you're right. that comes to stage. Absolutely correct. I mean, first is infrastructure. Again, deficit of that. Stage is very um, encompassing in the need for light, sound, you know need to do rehearsals every day. We don't have spaces where people can rehearse. But how about the, the mm -hmm. good old days of Herbert Oguni at Travelling Theatre? It died, like a Darling lot of things. Bayou. Yeah, yeah, it died, but it's coming back. I mean, it's not where it should be, but that's the case with so many things. But what it is is that a journey of a thousand steps, we already started. We didn't, we didn't have anything a couple of years back, or things had died sufficiently. But now it's coming back. Right now I know that there are about three or four um, plays over the Easter. So we can only look to the future, but we're doing our best. We keep pushing. If more spaces are available for young people to rehearse, there's a lot of people who want to do these things, but they just don't have the necessary backing. Okay, thank you very much, Bola and Austin Peters. Thank you for having me. Those of us who have not watched uh, The Man of God, we look forward yes, to it. Yes, you should. At least strong message there. Yes. Worship God, don't worship man. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, because all men are fallible. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you so much.